Well, welcome, Liz. Thank you very much for joining us here at Clark County today. Well, thank you for inviting me. It's always great to be back here. Great. Well, you made an announcement in January that surprised some of us and also disappointed others uh, that you were going to step away from politics. And this is our first chance to sit down with you and talk to you about that decision. And so I'd just like to ask you basically to give us some of your thoughts about what led to that announcement. Well, I'm a third termer, and the average term of office in the Washington House of Representatives is three terms, and I never intended on being a lifer in Olympia. I got a little bit of a late start, first getting elected uh, in 2012 at the age of 52, and I think that the founders envisioned that it was a citizen legislature and that we would come from our businesses or whatever background we have and go to the legislature, serve our constituents, serve our district, and then go back to doing what we were doing before we became a legislator. And I mean no disrespect for the great colleagues that I love and adore and have worked with that have been there for many, many years. This is just for me, I, I never intended that this would be a career. It's supposed to be public service not a public career. <laughs> <laughs> well, before we talk more about your, your experiences with the legislature, um, let's also uh, discuss, uh, you, you announced last fall that you would run for the county chair position here in Clark County, and part of your January announcement was that you would no longer seek uh, that position. Can you tell us a little bit about that decision? Sure. I started in anticipation of running for county chair. Last fall, I started attending those meetings. And I'm sitting in these long county council meetings realizing that this is why I'm leaving the legislatures because I'm tired of these long, long meetings. And I just realize I don't want to do this anymore. I just don't, there's a, a point in your life, particularly for me, now I'm 58, and I have more chapters that I want to pursue, more fun oriented businesses that I want to pursue because I, I've been in private sector all my life. I mean, the, before being elected to Kama City Council, I was private sector business for most most of my 38 years in, uh, in business. So for me, it was an easy decision sitting in the audience at the county thinking, I got to do something different. I want to do something more enjoyable with the next chapters of my life. So when I made the announcement, uh, it, it just felt so good. You know how when you decide to do something, there are times maybe you second guess that decision and there are other times where you are so confident that that was the right decision. And that's how I felt after I made that decision in January. So I'm moving forward with new things. What are some of those new things? I'm going to focus on our little farm in Fern Prairie. It's Shangri-La Farm. I'm also going to launch some art-related businesses, and you'll hear all about that in the yeah, future. Yeah, well, we have in the past <laughs> as well, yeah. That's very exciting. Well, let's talk about your three terms in the legislature. Uh, you know, I'm sure you've experienced a ton, and you've had disappointments probably. You've had accomplishments, certainly. Uh, tell us a little bit uh, maybe starting with the good things that you experienced in the legislature. The, probably the best things about being in the Washington legislature is representing the citizens back home. And it, that by itself has just been such an honor for me that voters would entrust me to represent their behalf in state government. And that's a something I never took lightly and I took it very seriously. And one of the things that I always said that I wanted to do as a state representative was to communicate with my constituents, to let them know what was going on in their state government. And there's a tendency for legislators to have PR people write all their materials. And from the very beginning, I insisted on taking a, a real vital role in the communications that I would send to my constituents. And I'm really proud of the fact that during session, people in my district hear from me almost once a week. And outside of session, they hear from me about once a month, which is pretty, pretty uncommon, I think, for a lot of state legislators. 
but I'm I'm proud of that commu that good communication that I provided. The other thing that has been really rewarding is the relationships that you build on both sides of the aisle, and that is very very important, particularly in partisan offices. Everybody represents their district, whether it's a liberal district or a more conservative district like mine, and then we all come together in Olympia, and it's important for us to recognize that we all have different constituencies. And I never lost a, a Democrat friend over a vote because we voted differently. We respect each other enough to know that they're representing their district, I'm representing my district, and I never felt betrayed or uh, shunned by Democrats on the other side of the aisle for my conservative votes. In fact, it's kind of cool being consistent and having people know you're conservative because you don't get bugged by all the lobbyists because they already know how I'm voting. Uh, it's only real obscure things that come around once in a while that uh, you know maybe you'll get a visit from a lobbyist from because it's some new policy. But by and large, uh, the relationships across the state that you make with all walks of life, people that represent all types of districts, th those have been really fun. Also, I've enjoyed the, there's a, a little bit of mentoring involved, uh, it appears, to be a state legislator because I've been fortunate to be involved with six different seniors at Camas High School over the last six years who wanted to shadow me for their high school senior project. And those have been just so much fun. It's It's been it's been a lot of fun for me, and hopefully the students enjoyed it too. I guess we'll find out. But I've made lifelong friends through this high school mentoring process, and that's been a lot of fun. And I think the, the most enjoyable times for them, I invited them to come to the legislature while we were in session so they could see the nuts and bolts of what it's like to be right in the middle of a legislative session. And all of them took me up on my offers, and uh, they accompanied me around the district for meetings, various meetings, and then also seeing firsthand the day in the life of a legislature during a session. And so those are those have been really neat things that I didn't really expect that would happen. And then, of course, some really great, wonderful uh, things have happened for Clark County. I'm proud to have been part of funding for the Shalachi Prairie Railroad. I'm sure that your readers uh, know that the Shalachi Prairie Railroad is a 33-mile line that the county owns, and it's a huge opportunity for us to attract new businesses to this county. And the fact that we export 70,000 people a day across the river to Oregon to work underscores the importance of us bringing jobs right here in Clark County. And so I'm proud of the fact that uh, I got a GMA rail bill through the legislature with the help of Joe Fitzgibbon, one of those great Democrats who, you know, politically were opposites, but we've been friends from the beginning, and he gave me his word that he was going to help get this policy out of the House of Representatives because he knew it was good for Clark County and that we had a unique uh, situation here and that he was going to help with that, and he did. He stayed true to his word, and uh, even through governor vetoes and everything else, the policy was finally enacted last year and now we just need the county to get it together and implement that policy now that the law was uh, effective in October in 2017. So here we are, spring of 2018, and we're still not implementing it. But I, I hope the county moves uh, a little faster to implement it than they are right and now. And potentially, what could that mean in terms of jobs in Clark County? If, if the folks that wanted to come here, still want to come here after the county finally gets the program implemented, it means tens of thousands of new jobs here. We've had uh, 15 different companies that wanted to locate here, and they all had two things in common. They needed a large parcel, and they needed access to the short line railroad. And they want to use the short line to get their job, get their products to market. And you can't get access to the main line anymore because BNSF controls that main line. So the only way you can use railroad to get your goods to market now is to have access to a short line that feeds into the main line, which the Shalachi Prairie does. That's why it's so integral for businesses and that's why they're, they're seeking to locate here. So once the county implements it, I think we'll be able to roll out the red carpet and invite these new companies here and uh, 
many of them were ready to employ as many as 500 and 1,000 employees. These are manufacturing facilities that are clamoring for these parcels along the rail. Uh, also some really great things, thanks to the taxpayers of this state, I was able to shepherd some significant transportation dollars and also some significant capital budget dollars to improve the infrastructure on this railroad. We have a bridge at milepost 12 that's 120 years old. It's made out of wood timbers. It's falling into the Salmon Creek. And uh, a couple of years ago in a, in, an, uh, in a supplemental budget year, I was able to convince the leaders on the Transportation Committee to invest $300,000 of taxpayer money for permitting, design, and engineering of the bridge, knowing that maybe if the state invested in the early stages that they would pay for the construction later on. And that is that proved to be a good strategy because this year uh, we were able to get $2.5 million for the entire construction of the bridge at milepost 12. And that will really help. Uh, it would be terrible to have companies locate and then have the bridge fail. Uh, and then we'd be dead in the water again. So uh, that will move forward thanks to taxpayer funding at the state level. And there's a north end operation too that uh, operates a tourist train at the north end of the Shalachi Line. And those folks, they've been mostly volunteers. They've been restoring historic steam engines and they run all kinds of really neat excursions. They have a Christmas tree train, they have a winery tour train. I think a bank robbery train or something like that. <laughs> no, they have fall colors. I mean, they have all these yeah. neat things. And people come from miles around to see steam engines because they are so rare. And so I was able to, with capital budget money, over a period of about three years, we were able to get uh, several buckets of money to basically pay for a maintenance facility and also a, an eventual museum in Yakult. And if you know anything about North Clark County, you know that Yakult is a very small town. It's the smallest city in my district. And they will benefit greatly from the economic development that will occur surrounding a steam engine museum that will locate there. So I think it's a long-term significant impact for the, the town of Yakult. And I'm looking forward to them being able to benefit from those state dollars that we leveraged. You know, obviously, uh, you spent your time in the legislature in the minority, so you didn't accomplish everything you wanted to accomplish. What are some of the things that, you know, were disappointing about your tenure? Well, being in the minority, as you're, you said it best, Ken, you don't have any of the cards when you're in the minority, and you basically have to beg and grovel for what I call crumbs, I'm, I'm quoting Nancy Pelosi, I can't believe that. But, uh, you know, we, we get a few crumbs when we're in the minority, particularly when you're a freshman. Everybody usually gets a freshman bill, and they kind of pat you on the head and say, good girl, you get a little freshman bill. But the, the things that I went to Olympia to do when I first got elected, I, I, I wanted to move mountains. I wanted to reform state agencies. And one of the disappointing things is shortly after I started my career in Olympia, I realized that the lawmakers aren't really in charge in Olympia. It's really the agency bureaucrats. They run the state. And that's unfortunate for the citizens because we have a governor today that is more concerned with his own green, uh, his, his own green agenda, climate change and carbon taxes. He's because he's focused on these very narrow ideologies, he's allowed his agencies to basically run amok. And I hate to be so blunt to say that, but I, in my opinion, that is exactly the way it is right now. And the state agencies are kind of running themselves because they don't have leadership from the governor's office. And they are much too powerful. They are much too big. Uh, they're, they, they write WACs, which are Washington Administrative Code rules, and we write RCWs, which is the Revised Code of Washington. So we write the laws that govern the state, and then the agencies write rules to implement the RCWs. 
But the problem with the agency bureaucrats is they go overboard in their rule writing. Uh, the last time I checked, the Department of Ecology had something like 43 full-time rule writers. That's a problem because they're busy putting up roadblocks for businesses that want to locate here and businesses that are already here. So I guess what was most disappointing is realizing that the legislature is very limited in what it can really do because the agencies are all powerful. And I don't see that changing unless Washington elects a governor that is completely different than the governors we've had over the last 16 to 20 years. You know, when I think about your career in politics, I think about uh, many things, but I, I think about, you mentioned jobs. I also think, especially recently, about the transportation congestion issues. You know, you held a series of three town halls here in Clark County in the past year um, dealing with that issue. Are you still going to be involved in any way uh, in some of these issues? I'm probably still going to be very outspoken, but from a non-elected position. Right. And you're right about transportation. We need solutions. And there, something that's very evident to me came out came about at these transportation town halls that I hosted. We need new corridors because the two corridors that we have are overloaded and you have this big funnel happening and we have all these people funneling into just two corridors to get to the other side of the river and unless you build new corridors so that you dilute that funnel, we're never going to fix the problem. And we can, we can replace the I-5 bridge but without fixing the I-5 corridor south of the river, it's going to have negligible impact because it's like putting a six inch pipe into a three inch pipe and expecting six inches of water to come out the other end. So we, we need new corridors. And the fact that Oregon is considering now tolling at the gate to Oregon and not give us any new bridges for our tolling dollars shows that they are not committed to paying for their own infrastructure and they want the 70,000 people that already give them over 200 million dollars a year in income tax to now help pay for their aging infrastructure that they've neglected for the last three decades because instead they've invested in light rail and transit that too few people ride. So Transportation is a big thing. It's, it's always been a big thing to me. I was really happy to sit on the Transportation Committee for the last five years of my six years there. And uh, hopefully the people that come after me will continue to talk about solutions that will work, not just replacing an aging bridge that feeds into a, a, a dysfunctional I-5 corridor south. Uh, I, I guess as long as we're on the disappointing mode. I'll just mention too, I guess for me one of the disappointing things is it's all the rules are changed now with partisan politics and it used to be if somebody was a Democrat they were a Democrat and if somebody was a Republican they were a Republican and it was a really clear delineation of the two-party system and you know if you were Republican it meant you were you wanted responsible government, you wanted limited government, you wanted lower taxes and and you wanted government to live within its means and and you wanted to rein in overregulation and burdensome government. Well, all those rules seem to be changed now and I guess over my time in office I've seen this erosion happen where people put an R after their name and they sell themselves as a conservative to the voters and then once they're in office something happens. <laughs> I don't know if the marble gets to them or what but they forget who brought them to the dance and they forget how they sold themselves to voters and you know I'd sure like to have all those summers and fall days back that I spent putting up signs for these candidates and holding fundraisers for them and giving them my precious donor lists uh, only to see them become something that was unrecognizable to me. So that's that's disappointing and I guess it makes us, it's not good for the electorate either when people are not trustworthy on the campaign trail and it just, it feeds this mistrust of government 
and it's our fault. I mean, if we're going to run for office, we ought to have the guts to say what we believe and predict how we're going to vote and be honest about it and expect to get either elected or not elected based on your core principles. So people need to, the, the citizens need to hold elected officials accountable. And if we don't do the things that we say we're going to do and we don't vote the way we say we're going to vote, we deserve to be thrown out of office, period. Speaking of that, uh, you, you kind of brought up the whole campaign trail thing. Uh, I've got to ask you, I'm putting you on the spot a little bit, but do you have an endorsement for your position? Oh, I absolutely do. John Lee is the guy. He is, I, I joke about him, he's a smarter, shorter, thinner male version of Liz Pike. <laughs> but politically, we are very similar. And what's really great about him is he has been a good friend of mine for the last, well, my whole time in office for the last six years. And he has participated in a lot of the forums that I've hosted to my constituents. And he's been right there. He's testified at lots of city council meetings and and lots of county council meetings and CTRAN meetings. And he is very, very up on the issues. I mean, this is a gentleman, super smart, captain with Delta Airlines, career aviator. He is already ready to serve on day one. He will have a very short learning curve just because he's already been steeped in all these issues that I've been working on for the last six years. So yes, John Lee, he's the guy, 18th District Representative, position two. Uh, I still consider you a, a very young uh, uh, woman. Is there any chance that uh, someday you might change this decision and re-enter elected, uh, uh, seek elected office again? One of my friends that I trust and value very much told me the other day, she said, Liz, never say never. Yeah. So I'm not gonna say never, but this decision to step away right now feels really right for me and Neil, my husband. I just, I want to do some other things that, uh, and quite frankly, you know, the, the whole political climate is completely different than it was in 2012 when I first got to Olympia. People have been, they've become mean, and maybe it's social media, um, maybe it's just, I don't know what it is, but it's just, it's not the same as it was. And I think the really neat thing, going back to Olympia and bipartisanship and working across the aisle, the really neat thing is that there is a respectfulness for the institution of state government in Olympia. And you see it in all of our committee meetings and you see it in our floor debates. There's decorum and there's respect for opposing views, and nobody ever gets out of line. Well, if you do get out of line, you get gaveled down. I mean, down comes the gavel and your microphone's turned off. So there's a respect for the institution and civility, and that is what I would like to see return to politics, or at least you know, move in that direction, because right now uh, it's, it's hard to convince good, hardworking people to run for office because they know that their people are going to make up stories about them. They're going to be lied about. They're going to, you know, their opposition is going to send out mailers that aren't even close to the truth. Uh, their records are going to be uh, tainted. And who, who wants that? Who, who's, who wants to sign up for that kind of treatment? So I think that's something we need to we need to fix. I mean, it's okay to point out the flaws of, of somebody who's a challenger or a voting record, for example. But these personal attacks, I just think there's, there's no place in s civil politics for those kinds of personal attacks that have nothing to do with the office. Well said, well said. Well, thank you very much for joining us today and explaining uh, your, your decisions, your recent decisions. And uh, we thank you for your public service and wish you the best in the future. Well, thank you, Ken. I really appreciate it. And thank you for giving me a little forum here. And I just, I would just close with saying I'm just very, very grateful to the citizens for putting me in Olympia and trusting me to represent them. It's just been a, a fabulous 
experience. And I, I feel like I've graduated from the University of the Washington State House of Representatives because of all the policy information that we learn about. And every day is a new day, and we learn things every day, whether we're in Olympia or back in our home district with our constituents. And it's just been a very gratifying experience. I'm just very grateful for the opportunity.